Well, maybe I'll just formally welcome everyone who's either joining live or who is listening to this later because you're out closing your own deals right now or helping your reps do that. Um, welcome to our masterclass today. We're going to be talking about closing deals as a sales leader, the do's and don'ts. I will be providing a lot of those don'ts and hopefully uh, the folks on this panel or other folks joining in might have some suggestions on how to do it well. Um, so I can introduce myself real quick. So Ross Rich, CEO and co-founder of Accord, which is a customer-facing collaboration platform for B2B sales, onboarding, and success. Feel free to check it out. And uh, maybe let everyone do a mini intro, both uh, maybe where you're at today and a bit of context and background as yourself as either an IC or sales leader. And then we can uh, dive right into the questions and, uh, and Q&A. Um, Olivia, since you're on mute, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you kick things off here. Sure. Thanks for having me, Ross. Um, appreciate the invite. Um, and so my name is Olivier. Uh, as mentioned, I'm in Boulder. Uh, I've been in tech for uh, the last, you know, pretty much the last 12 years or so. Uh, got in uh, in tech a little later uh, than most people. Uh, 30, started a glass door, uh, learned a ton there and uh, went to a small company called Fliptop. Uh, ran revenue for them uh, for 18 months until we got acquired by LinkedIn. Um, so this first time I got to lead a sales team and, and build out a team. Uh, it was an early stage company. I think I joined nine people uh, by the time we got acquired, about 45. Then I went to uh, another company called G2, uh, G2 Crowd formerly, and uh, scaled that uh, you know from one to 50 million ARR in four years. Um, and uh, we went from like you know 30 to 500 employees. So that was a really fun run. Um, then I went uh, to a company called Metadata, um, which is a seed uh, company in the marketing technology space, automating demand generation. Uh, I spent uh, close to three years there um, overseeing go to market um, and um, yeah, basically scaled the, the revenue um, you know, uh, 800% in, uh, in two and a half years. Casually 800%. Um, cool. Looking forward to hearing some of your advice from those different journeys and different levels, obviously, of, of sales leadership and how involved you get in, uh, in those frontline deals. But uh, Stratton, how about yourself? Yeah, yeah. I'll follow that up. Um, you know, that impressive resume. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Olivier. Uh, so I uh, started out at Wayfair um, a little over like eight and a half years ago, um, just on the front lines, just taking calls and uh, was able to be a part of one of the first B2B sales teams there, um, moved up into a manager um, and then helped scale and build our uh, onboarding team um, in Utah. So pretty much we kind of started a whole new department and, you know, a whole new process for first touch with customers and, you know, ran that for a couple of years and then decided I wanted to jump into the startup world. And so um, I'm here at Toolbox now. Um, we deliver construction materials. Um, so think Uber Eats for construction materials, but, uh, you know, tech in, uh, in that industry is, is very, there's not, not a whole lot out there. So, uh, we kind of took our framework and we are building e-commerce platforms specifically for building material suppliers. So, uh, we've been running that for oh, just right over about six months, seven months. We've signed up just about 40 customers and, um, we're going to continue to grow those. There's not a ton, so it's always like a, a big deal when we get them going, but yeah, we're, we're on that and just continuing to build that tech and build our product out. So it's been a, it's been a lot of fun. Awesome. Awesome. And to round things out. Nice. Cool. Thank you. Um, probably shouldn't be on this call given those two resumes, but here I am. Uh, so I've been an IC, uh, well in, in tech sales for, for 12 years now. Um, first job I came out of uni into, didn't think I ever wanted to be a salesperson. I mean, I don't think anyone wakes up and goes, mom, dad, I'm in sales. Um, but that was me. I fell into it. Uh, had a good run at kind of a big corporate for the first go. Um, decided then I wanted to give the whole startup thing a, thing a run and became kind of the first on the ground sales hire twice in a row. Um, and in that first company that I did that for was a, a collaboration software. And um, as on my own kind of over four years scaled from Kind of zero in revenue to, to about two and a half, three million um, pounds in, in kind of ARR as, as an IC. Got a taste for a bit of leadership as I started to build some teams around me mm -hmm. and then went to um, at Zen Cargo, which is a logistics and freight business as, an, as their first kind of SaaS experience salesperson. Um, stepped up into leadership there, ran the whole revenue function or sales function, scaled them from, I think it was around two or three to about 15. Over, over a couple of quarters, did some fundraising. And then, because I'm a sucker for pain, doing it all over again, 
um, and scaling scaling teams and, and, and revenue at a company called Hakoda today. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, hopefully we're going to, everyone feels comfortable on this panel sharing some of their hard-earned lessons, which typically is from the mistakes that uh, we've either made or are still making today. So today we're going to be again talking about closing deals as a sales leaders, the do's and don'ts, this really tough balance between trying to build out teams, especially if you're, you know, earlier in your career around um, developing sales organizations, um, or later, I think it's a hard kind of thing to grow out of if you love sales and working with customers. How do you balance building out your team for success as well as making sure, you know, especially in the startup world, you're bringing in that revenue that day, that month, that quarter. Um, so the first question that I have is, you know, maybe everyone's take on how you think about this balance. Maybe it's based on the stage. Maybe it's based on the rep you're with. Maybe it's based on that particular deal or month or quarter. How do you think about balancing when you jump onto that call I know I'm likely the person that is going to have the highest win rate, or hopefully you are, at that company. Um, how do you think about balancing jumping in and leading the call and, and you know, closing that deal or creating that coaching opportunity uh, and empowering your team to, to up level? Um, so maybe we can go in reverse order here. Um, yeah, how do you think about that, that tough decision when you're jumping on that important call? Let's say it's five days before the end of the quarter. It's a late stage opportunity and your rep has been managing the deal and you're there. For me, I always look at it as what what could I add to this call, right? What 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 if the reps got it to a certain stage? Let's, let's take the example that it is kind of that last bit of negotiation, that last contracting call, or whatever it is to bring the deal home. What am I going to add in terms of value? Is it the case of the 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 prospect sees oh there's a senior stakeholder I can get a bigger discount now, or is it um, oh why is the senior stakeholder coming? Are they, are they, am I important? Is there something they're not telling us? You know, so what value are you going to add first of all is, is probably the first question you want to answer. Uh, and then actually work with the rep before you go into the call. And I think every good leader and every double team or trio act that goes into a meeting should do a kind of a pre, pre-meeting prep call and just assign the roles, yeah. right? These are the questions we want you to ask Naz. James, John, these are the questions you're going to lead. And here's the objections we think we're going to get. And here's how we're going to handle them. So just have that game plan going into it so you don't have the awkward, oh, oh no, you first, no, you first, no, you first uh, piece. So just really have that plan when you're going in there and understand what value are you going to bring to the deal that your rep couldn't bring. Totally. I love that advice around the, the prep call beforehand and the roles. I feel like uh, sometimes between meetings and busy schedules, you know, it's an important call and kind of maybe send a couple of slacks, but super key to, to get in the zone there and, and make sure you're super clear. And Stratton, what's your take on this? Yeah, I think, think Nas like read my, my notes, some of the things that I had written down, because I, I, I specifically had there, like, make sure you do a pre, like a game plan, right, going in. Um, and it was also something that he mentioned earlier too, like, yeah, bring, bring your value, but you're coming in with, you know, with the title, right, like, or with the, the, the ambiance of like, oh, I'm, the, the director or the VP, like, so leverage that effectively is how I always try and like, you know, don't come in and, and be that, you know, huge closer, the bull in the China shop, that's just going to come in and steamroll everybody. Like that's, that's not my style either. And so I think, you know, when you're trying to find the balance, I'm always thinking for myself, like, look, you know, it, it's kind of that teach a man to fish type of thing. Like if I can model the behaviors and I can help you know, move the deal forward and I can show or either model or showcase, you know, some of the best practices and good questions to ask so that they're asking those in their next deal. Because ideally, like I want to be out of a job, right? Like I want my reps to be able to do everything that I do or do everything that they need to do. So I think that's the balance I always try and go in with is like, how can I make this some sort of coaching moment so that they're taking that away and they're not thinking, oh, I got, I got to call Stratton if I ever need a, a deal to close. I want them to be able to say, oh, okay, I saw him do that. Like, let me try it out before I need to bring him in the next time. So that's how I always try and like balance it is come in like, yes, we need to close the deal, especially early startup, like need to hit the number and stuff. But I always want to make sure that there's at least some coachable moment in there so that they can, they can do it the next time. So they're not always looking to me to be the, the chief solutions officer. And, and Olivia, any yeah, so thoughts to that? 
I think it depends on a variety of things. Um, so one is, you know, the stage that the company is at, right? So I've been at seed company, series A, B, C, and obviously I would act very differently uh, depending on the stage of the company. Other thing to keep in mind is like, where are you in terms of your target, uh, like to your goal, this specific quarter? Because I might act differently. Uh, yeah depending on where we're at in the quarter um, and might get more involved. And uh, another thing is, is a give to get, right? If somebody's going to ask me to come in for a negotiating call, or if it's an intro call, because I have a relationship with somebody um, and, you know, we're going to ask different questions. And, and, you know, at this stage of my career, I'm pretty uh, busy on a day-to-day basis. And so I want to maximize where I spend my time. And if I can move the needle and help a rep learn in the meantime, I think it's great and close the deal. Um, and so, you know, I'm taking all of these different factors into uh, my evaluation process there. But a big thing here for uh, an account executive or if you're you know, a manager and you have a team is to you know make sure that before you are asked to be on a call, you need to make that rep request something in return. I will bring power to the call. Yeah. In order for that to happen. If you're dealing with a director, I need your VP on. If you're dealing with VP, I need your CMO on, right? If I'm going to, you know, bring a, one of our executives to a call, I need that for, for you know, so that we can fast track the decision making process. Um, especially now, right? Uh, we're dealing with a downturn, and uh, people are going to take longer to make decisions. There will be more people involved in the decision making process. CFOs are being asked uh, to evaluate more than they have in the past, and so depending on what your needs are as the account executive to try to close that deal, you need to figure out how to leverage uh, those executives that you're going to bring on a call to get to that decision quicker. Um, and so that is one of the things. Don't just, you know, always ask to, you know, pimp out one of your executives to be on a call. You need something in return. Yeah, that's that's a great tip and maybe a good bridge into the next set of questions or, or advice from this group. So just heard obviously the game planning before, what are the potential objectives? What roles are we, we playing on the call? Coachable moments, Olivier, great tip on, like I think people don't do enough before calls on that email chain or syncing with the champion before, like how do we make the most of these people's time that are joining? Especially if there's more than that one-on-one or two-on-one conversation, making sure you're bringing that person, um, not just because they're gonna have some great answer or whatever, but to use it as a lever to bring someone else in that you maybe not have been able to in the past. Um, I'd love to get maybe one or two best tips or practices on using executives, either the sales leader or CEO or whoever it is uh, to win those deals. Happy to, to, to start. The one thing that I love is in sales, regardless of if it's this type of tactic or something else is the no ask email is the, hey, I'm going to send you this note that's purely going to provide value. I don't need a call. I don't need a response. I think a great way to to do this that a lot of people don't that I learned at Stripe early on because everyone loved the Carlson brothers on our biggest deals early on the process, whether they're existing customers using us for part of their business or they never use us at all, to draft a note and say, hey, was on our, you know, caught up with Ross who leads our strategic accounts. Sounds like there's some interesting early conversations going. Just wanted to reach out and say, I was excited about hearing this thing, maybe mentioning something specific that they could, that realistically that they are excited about, it should be true. And typically the founders or sales leaders are going to be excited about these early conversations. Say, if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out. They're probably not going to, but that is a great leg in for when something happens, whether it's the close and everything's going really well, or something goes sideways and you have that in, it doesn't feel kind of awkward. So that's going to be my one to throw out there. If it's something you don't already do, a great thing to, to test out. Yeah, I, I agree with that one, Russ. Um, <clears throat> we, one thing I've, I've built out is, is going slightly a step further to that is at the start of every quarter, you take that snapshot of the pipeline. You look at what the deals are you're trying to close out and you identify what are your, what are your P1 deals for that quarter? Right. What are the deals that are going to move the needle, both revenue, both um, from a logo perspective, from a recognition perspective? What are the deals we're going to we're going to prioritize and go after that take us to our quota or above? Mm-hmm. And then break those down in terms of the skill sets required to close them. So for, from, from my perspective, I've always had quite a complex sale 
and you need um, operational knowledge, you need financial knowledge, risk knowledge, credit knowledge, all these different things. And we've got an SLT that run each of those functions. So what we assign at the beginning Sorry, of every- SLT for- Like a senior team. leadership team. Yeah. Like the, all the VPs, like the VP of ops, the VP of credit, yeah. the VP of sales, et cetera. And then you've got the founders. So we actually assign exec sponsorship to each one of those P1 deals based on what skill sets are gonna be required to help close it. So the more technical sales, we put our CTO onto them. Um, and then, you know, the more operational ones, we'll put our VP of ops on. The more risky ones, or where there's risk and we have to manage in terms of credit and financial services, we'll put our VP of risk and credit on them, or a founder. And then we do the thing you mentioned, which is they would reach out and say, hey, I run the ops team at Godo, heard about the use case that you know, Zach is exploring with you, really excited by it, happy to help you with any questions you might have. Not expecting a response, but as long as you've got that exec sponsorship alignment, they become the senior stakeholder that comes into the call. So it's not always me going into every call. I love that. Then you free yourself up, but then you're also providing unique value for that specific customer. So it feels less like a sales tactic and more aligned to their goals. And like, oh, they actually brought this specific person and it's really relevant. I, I like that approach. Gonna... Yeah, I think it's it's important to also make, you know, the prospect feel uh, the love, right? And, uh, you know, the company's already talking about, um, you know, their account internally before their customer, I think is critical. Uh, we also use exec sponsors um, with metadata. We typically assign that once the deal closed. Uh, but one of the things that I would do is that I would, um, similar to Nazare, is I would go ahead at the beginning of the quarter and look at all of the important deals in pipeline. And then what I would do is I would ping via on LinkedIn, send an email to the exec sponsor. Say, I just want to thank you. Um, your team is currently um, taking time to value your platform. Um, and like I said, just want to thank you for that. And if I can be a resource, I'd love to connect. Uh, majority of the time, they wouldn't hit, hit me up, but one, I have a new connection now. And then if they become a customer, I would ping them again. Thank you so much for becoming a customer. You know, I'd love to be a resource for you, anything related to metadata. Um, and then over time, you're building that, that relationship, even if, you know, you don't connect. At one point, if something goes wrong, you know they're going to hit you up, right? And so at least now they know that, you know, if I buy the software and I'm not that involved with it, wasn't part of onboarding, like the execs are typically not part of the onboarding process. But now if something goes wrong, you have direct access to that person and they will ping you. Yeah, it's that escape valve, right? You don't want to go too long with something that bad happens. If they feel like they can ping you, that's, that's really helpful. Yeah. And I, I'll, I'll jump in and like, so I would say it, it's the after deal because I'm scaling, right? Because I, we're, we're trying to figure things out and we're still putting processes in place. It, it's the after call, like with the rep, the after call coaching is something that I always try and make sure that we we do and we talk about, right? So that they have those takeaways. So, you know, big on coaching. If we if I'm in on a deal and I'm asking questions, um, you know, trying to bring those implication questions in and really ask the higher level to move the decision maker forward and like, let's actually like make this happen. Um, after the call, I always like to hop on with the reps and be like, Hey, what did you hear? What did you, what did you like? What are, what are you taking away from it? You know, what can you implement? I think that's something that like I always try and do afterwards and make sure that I'm not just hopping in, throwing things around, you know, and then hopping out and going somewhere else. I like to take a few minutes and just make sure that they're really picking up on those behaviors and what are the things that they can implement, you know, and then also to, it helps them calibrate on when to bring other people in. You know, they always bring me in and like help quarterback. Do we need product? Do we need marketing? Do we need CEO, right? CFO. Um, but it helps them know when to ask for that even more effectively the next time, right? Because the last thing I want is my reps always looking to me to be like, hey, come come help with this, come help with this, right? Totally. So I'd say just do those after after call coachings. Yeah, um, that's that's a good point. Yeah, you similar to... Um, I don't think I'm going to have to implement this right after is how do you kind of broaden the group of people so it doesn't just fall in one. Also, you know, if you're at a startup, it's probably really helpful for other folks on the leadership team to be on those frontline emails and conversation and calls. It's really helpful to build that empathy for the sales team. I think that that is something that's missing from a lot of teams. And I talk to folks, senior leaders, especially on the revenue side that have, that might not have um, a founding team or CEO um, that has a has background in sales and a deep understanding. And I think there's a, a huge lack of empathy there that you can really, really build. And I saw that really transformational in my time at Stripe when we started to get a broader group of senior leaders on calls and to kind of make sure that every quarter, every month, there was one or two 
that you should have. And it really changed the way that that uh, cross-functional collaboration happened at the, at the company. Ross, I'm not sure salespeople need empathy. All they need is <laughs> a lot of SQLs. I was like, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> for those. I want to add one more thing to Ross. Like you just made me think uh, if you're in that mode, right? Where you maybe, cause we did just bring in a new head of product and then head of marketing. They weren't here from the, from the start. Um, we, we record as many demos as we can. So we try and record them and then I'll, I'll push it up to the, the leadership team. And that's right. been something that's been helpful. It's like, Hey, instead of me trying to articulate all this information, we try and record our demos and then I'll kind of give some, you know, timelines, tag people at specific points, but it really helps get that context up to the leadership team. So also when they jump in on the demos, they have that context. They know what customers are saying. Yeah. I want to add some, something here because um, what not to do. And so, um, you know, I've been fortunate. I've, I've gotten the opportunity to, you know, work at some great companies, great products and, and scale some, some big teams. And one of the things that um, we did a G2 is that, you know, when I joined the team, there was like two or three reps. By the time I left, I think we were like 150 across, you know, sales, account management, CS, and so on. And even, you know, at, towards my end of my tenure there, you know, the VP of sales, Clay, myself, uh, we had, um, you know, Kevin Young. Um, uh, we, at the end of quarter, we just got on calls and close a bunch of deals, right? And and it worked. It worked. But it wasn't, you know, the best way to, to operate, but it was a pretty transactional sale, right? And at the price point, it was pretty, pretty low. Low and and um, it was really easy for um, some of the leaders to, to close those deals for the reps, uh, but that is not necessarily the the most effective way there um, to operate. And so one of the the pieces of advice I have for for sales management is to start working on enablement way quicker. And so at G two, I don't think we had enablement until we had a hundred people uh, that were you know revenue generating. Um, and one of the things that we did at Metadata this year is we went from seven to twenty five reps in the first couple of months of the year, and that's when we hired enablement. So that you know compared to all the other companies that worked at, we hired enablement way sooner than we did, and that really helps, right? So as Trent was mes- mentioning, you know there's a lot of great technology out there. You know the you know the Gong for example, um, all the calls are recorded, and then you can you know have you know insights into the words that are being used and so on. And, and you want to make sure that one, you're recording all the calls um, and there should be part of a manager's job. It should be to listen to a few calls a week. Um, I would highly recommend that on a Friday afternoon, some of the you know sales managers out there will listen, highlight one rep every week and talk through it. You know, what did the rep do well? What can they learn from? And you do it, you know, maybe over a beers or some beverages on a Friday afternoon. It makes it a lot more fun. But if you can invest in enablement, that means that you will not have or require uh, your sales managers or VPs of sales to come in at the end of a quarter to close those deals. Um, and yes, they can do it. But what's more important is enabling your team to be successful because it empowers them and then they increases, you know, their um they feel better about themselves, right? And then they're um, they, they feel like they they can do it themselves. And so that is one of the things that you know I feel like I could have done a better job in my past by bringing on enablement way sooner at a company that is scaling. Yeah. Well, I'm just gonna ask the, the tough question for this group uh, with that with that context, Olivier, because I find I'm terrible at this when I'm gonna call rep asked me to join or, um, you know, I, I got the intro and something like that. I'm a terrible person at like sharing the mic and I just haven't built that muscle yet as a sales leader. It's, it's just, it does I don't have it. I'm not good at it yet. But my question is for this group is yes, everyone can say and look back and we closed these deals, but I wish I did this and blah, blah, blah. Do you still feel like it levels the playing field in terms of those win rates and conversions? If you're on that first call with that outbound that's a great company. If you're on that second or third call building that use case and validation and being that expert for your company in early stage startup, how close can you get to coming in with that title, coming in with that understanding, that confidence to someone that you're coaching? Because this is the real question, right? We're not talking about at Oracle, at Salesforce, at whatever company. We're talking about when revenue really matters and you're picking those five, 10 accounts every quarter, every month. Sometimes does it come down to like, that's the unscalable things you need to do to hit those three, four, five X revenue goals every quarter and every, every to compound every year. So that's my, I'm curious to get everyone's take on this is like, Hey, maybe this is the 80, 20, but you know, at our, you know, we're 15 people, every deal yeah. makes a huge difference. It's really hard. Yeah. Go for it. Exactly. Exactly. I would say, um, as that for, as early stage for me, right. Cause I've always done kind of the pre a, a to B as you scale up, 
you're still figuring out what your ICP is. You're still figuring out what your product market fit is. You don't, you don't know. And you're then required to build a repeatable process for all these reps you're going to hire. So if you haven't gone through the process on four or five different kinds of deals, four or five different kinds of customers and use cases, you have no hope of building the process, right? You're going to tell your reps, oh, go do this because it's best practice. But I don't know if it's going to work. I, I don't know. So you've got to really practice it and, and, and practice what you preach as well. Um, and I've got some weird and wonderful techniques and question and answer types that I've been teaching my reps. And for some of them, it's, it's really uncomfortable. They say, there's no way I'm going to ask that. There's no way, Naz, I'm going to say that. What's an example? Do you have one example of maybe a tough question that, that people struggle to, to ask on calls? Just going really hard on qualification. Some people don't want to do it. So my, one of my examples is, hey, you know, we've been looking at this deal together. We've been working around this use case. I really just don't think you're a fit. That is one of the best lines, by the way, uh, people listening. If you qualify out the person, you're not a fit. Guess what's going to happen? It's a mind game. Qualify, yeah. They're, They're going to like, I want, I want to be qualified. I want to be a good fit. Um, and so um, you should definitely use that if you're not sure, if, if they're not willing to play ball and give you the information you need to make a decision, just tell them they're not a fit. And then they're going to fight to make you believe they're a fit. Exactly. But tell a rep who's conscious and precious about his pipeline or her pipeline to say that, they never will, right? So you've got to go, trust me, it works and watch me do it if you don't believe me. So you've got to kind of show them that the process works. It's not as scary as they think. Um, and once they do it once or twice, they get over that uncomfortableness and that fear and they'll go and do it all the time. You'll get a Slack message. Hey, Naz, I tried it out with this new prospect. Guess what? I've moved it to stage two, you know, whatever it is. So they go and try and believe in the process themselves. And that's your ultimate goal to get your repeatable process brought into and adopted by every rep you hire. Because you've got the gong calls to show it works. You've got the deals closed to show it works. Yeah. And that's how you get people involved. Yeah, I, I love think that so Sorry, sorry, just to summarize that before I pass it off is like, I love that maybe something I can start to do to scale me if, hey, I'm feeling like maybe other people don't know how to answer this question or objection because I've been, you know, talking about this thing of a cord for three years and, you know, our earliest reps like a year ago. Um, here's the gong of it. I don't necessarily need to be on the call. I don't need to do it for your deal. But here's an example of it working. And that kind of aha moment, like you're talking about, maybe that's a good way is maybe I have to do it first. But here's the proof when you're going to ask that tough thing or do something that's, that's new. I love that, but sorry, Stratton, go for it. Oh no, you're good. I was just going to say like, I, I love disqualifying, right? Like can or uh, prospects because it does, it shifts that power dynamic too of like, instead of you feeling or your reps feeling like they're chasing somebody all the time, it's that consultative approach of like, Hey, look, I'm trying to figure out if this is a good fit for you as well, or for us as well. And it just, yeah, from that customer perspective, it's fun to see that shift of like, Oh, this isn't you trying to sell me. This is us trying to like, figure out how to make a business decision to move forward. But um, yeah. the other thing, yeah, that I wanted to, to touch on in two places is because it is so hard to not just jump on everything, especially in this early stage, right? Like, and especially as a founder or CEO, right? Because it's just like every deal matters. Um, but I would say two things. Number one, like, I know it's a little off topic, but kind of but like hiring is so important, right? Like, so important, like hire slow, fire fast, right? Like, make sure you're bringing in the right people that you can trust that they will start doing the right behaviors that you need, right? Um, so I would say that's super important. And then to Naz's point, like just tons of calibration and training. Um, I found that doing tons of mock demo, like, right? Like call your reps every once in a while and just have them you know, jump in and have people do demos and let's, let's, let's calibrate on what worked, what didn't work. How can we really start challenging each other um, to grow quickly as well? Because I, I just, from my perspective, I don't want to do that. Like, I, I feel like if I'm jumping in on every single deal, like I'm, I'm doing something wrong. I'm not leading my people or coaching my people. And I really want them to, to learn how to do it. It's a fine balance, right? Cause you can't have them fail on every deal and you're not bringing deals in that, that's not really going to work. So I would just say, yeah, it's like that fine balance, hire the right people. And then just tons of calibration, tons of coaching, always, you know, challenging your reps to do more, ask, ask tougher questions. Um, switch that power dynamic. So they're not always trying to sell people. They're really becoming that consultative approach is, is kind of how I try to go about it with my team. And I think it depends a lot on where the salesperson in particular is at in their, in their growth. Right. And so um, at G2, for example, I hired a ton of 
23, 24 year olds. And many of them over time became, you know, some of them like, you know, Danny Reed met him, he was like 24. And now he's a director of sales and metadata, you know, five years later. And so we've had a lot of people that were young and then we trained them and, and uh, it takes years though to develop, right? And so I think it's really important one to, you know, have a, a BDR uh, team that you create early on. Um, and then that is your future, you know, bench for really good talent. And you can have that talent at a fraction of the cost if they grow with you. And by the time they're in AE, they already know the talk tracks, right? You just got to coach them on how to do it. And so you have to understand where the rep in, part, you know, in question is at in their growth and also what their aspirations are. Um, you know, if you're a sales manager and you don't know what your reps want to do when they grow up, Two years from now, five years from now, that that is an area that you need to look into, because you know when you're dealing with a lot of millennials, um, they all want to be a CEO or you know uh, something like that, and so you have to make sure that you know you you level set their expectations and say you know I'm going to help you get to that next stage. Uh, but one of the things I did at Metadata is you know I hired a bunch of senior people that I'd worked with in, in the past, and so we were able to grow really aggressively in the first two years here with a fraction of of, uh, the reps needed, um, you know, at other companies, right? So our reps were closing, you know, one and a half million dollars a year, uh, while you know many companies a rep will have a quota of like half a million, seven fifty, based on it. And so I was basically hiring experienced reps um, that I didn't really have to coach that much because I had worked with them in the we past. Work bandwidth that way, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's something to think about as well, uh, because if you're hiring seasoned people, like they don't want you taking over uh, and they're like, I know how to do this. I just want you on the call because of your title. That's it, man. Just show up, say hi, wave. And then that's about it. I'm going to take it over. Yeah. All right. Well, last question, the last four minutes here. I, I just thought of this. I don't know how I didn't write this down before, but something that we've seen, I've seen a lot lately is with people trying to sell myself for our company stuff, they bring in a senior leader. Honestly, these are some of the worst pitches that I've ever seen. These heads of sales, VPs of sales, CROs, like crazy, like no questions. They talk for like 15 minutes. And then I'm, we're all sitting there like, like looking off, like slacking each other, being like, what is happening right now? Like this is their sales leader. I'm curious to get, <laughs> if other people have this experience as sales leaders are probably bought in technology, so we're talking about the do's and don'ts and how to get off calls. Honestly, I feel like these people would be in a way better place if they just had their rep do the call. But am I going crazy that the higher up sometimes you get in these organizations, the worse they are at selling? Especially at enterprise level. Uh, if, you know, and it depends how long you've been selling, right? I, you know, to me, as we were talking earlier on the call, like, Selling is the, my favorite part of my job, right? Even though if I manage, you know, VPs and so on now, and I don't get involved that much, like I still love it. Um, and so it really depends, you know, some, some people are really good people managers, right? People that make it into, you know, VP and as VP titles uh, and, you know, C-level suite, they're excellent people managers, uh, but they might, you know, it's been a while since they did the job. And so they might not be as good. And so I think it just depends, but I, I can relate. I've been there. Yeah, I think I've seen, you can tell when it's somebody that is more of a technical leader, right? Like they're the people that are putting in the processes and they're doing all the internal stuff. And it has been a while before they've gotten on the phone. And that that's one thing that like, no matter what I do, I, I, I'm i same with Olivier. Like I always love being on calls. I love being in front of customers. Like I love scaling, like that's fun, but I love being on the call. Like I love asking the questions and getting that interaction. And so, yeah, you can tell when somebody is a little rusty and they're not asking the questions, they're just coming in and just steamrolling, right? They're just the just coming in. I'm going to tell you everything. I'm going to tell you why we're great. And you're just kind of, yeah, it's, it's funny when you're on the other side of it too. And you're like, oh man, ask, ask me a question or something. Like I want to answer, but you're just, you just don't stop talking. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting one, but that's, that's usually my take is usually I can tell when somebody's more focused on, you know, their business and, and how they're running it and not, they haven't been on a call. They haven't been in front of a customer in a while and they haven't been able to ask those questions. So um, again, just back to like, recording those demos and stuff and sending them to everybody across the, across the organization. That's what I've helped has helped, you know, my product team and my marketing team, if they're not getting in front of customers, just hearing that and seeing that and having that context. So when they jump on again, they're not jumping on and just kind of steamrolling everything and just trying to say how great they, you know, their marketing packages that they've created. Yeah. I think, I think we can all, you know, unanimously, unanimously say we've, uh, we've been on the receiving end of, of pitch pitch slaps maybe um but 
I, I, I've, I've been at the AE where that's happened. And I'm just like, oh, God, why, why oh where the CEO is back from your company and you're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 stop talking. Um, but then it goes back to the point I made right at the beginning. Right? I, it was my fault because I didn't coach them. I have to coach my senior leader on what I want from them in the call. And every time I get invited now to, to meetings, my reps know they can bring me, they know they want me there, but my, they know what I'm going to ask them. What do you want me to do? What are you, why are you bringing me? Yeah. Um, and I'm guessing those that are doing it today, you know, maybe we should all try and help them out, but is it a case of trying to, and this is horrible if it is, but kind of show up their reps, say, hey, look at me, I can pitch. Look how good I am. But maybe it's what Olivier said, which is they're just out of touch. You know, they've just not done it in a while. And they want to- I don't think it's a good way to lead, right? Um, no. you know, I've, I've scaled big teams. A lot of people, you know, love having uh, me as a leader and because, you know, I want what's best for them, right? And I always know where they want to go and I will do my part to get them there. Uh, Brian Carmen made some comment here, uh, which I thought we should highlight. Those who can't sell, manage. And a question mark. And I don't think it's true. The, the, the unfortunate thing that happens in sales is that if you're really good at selling, you're likely to get a management role. The thing is, is the majority of the best sellers are not going to be good managers because they're too focused on themselves, right? At the end of the day, they just care about themselves and they want to make a lot of money and they want to have a lot of freedom and so on. And when you're a leader, that's not, you're not going to be a good leader if you're always thinking about me first. You always have to think about your team. And so I think, unfortunately, that, you know, you know, people that are you know good at selling, but they're not the best will take longer. And I mean, for me, for example, I think I was a really good seller, but I, I, I sold from the age of 25 until 35. Right. I sold for 10 years before I got into management. And then in a short amount of time, I was able to to grow as a leader. Um, and, you know, and I don't know if I would be a good as good of a leader today if I got in management when I was 27 or 28, when I thought I was ready for it. And so, you know, if you're going to lead, it can't be about you. Um, it has to be about your team. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, I hope that's not what's wrong with me around around these um, and just getting, you know, classic founder jumps on. You're like so excited about your product and like telling the story and everything. And then you're like, OK, we should close this deal. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. I like that you're a former salesperson that's a CEO like that. That brings me joy because, um, you know, most of the time CEOs are, are technical or their product, right? Engineering product. So I love seeing a, um, a founder of a you know young company that comes from sale. That is inspirational. So keep it up. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, shout out to also my brother slash other co-founder who was also in sales before. Um, but you need that. You know, definitely also need that technical uh, leader as well. But any any you know final parting thoughts or things that you picked up that's worth dropping? Uh, we got about three minutes here. Um, I got some you know what I wrote down myself. I'm going to be planning much more before calls with reps. That's my really really big takeaway. Um, and then also sharing those recordings. I think get off the great call. I'm like oh this gong going to start maybe in our notion sharing a list maybe broken down by certain components of, of some great calls that we've had in stages so those are my two personal takeaways any other kind of thoughts from this group and uh yeah things you wanted to share or takeaways on your end from the session uh i i can't remember who said it but it was my favorite line i think of the whole thing was don't pimp out your executives so i'm gonna keep that one i'm gonna take that one it's 100 percent probably my give to line. get is critical <laughs> i didn't know if oh. i should use that word but it was like it's it's the perfect word the right <laughs> word it's the perfect word. Uh, no, I thought that was funny. So I took that one out. But yeah, Ross, I'm the same with you. I think what I'm going to remember to do is just, just talk less. You know, I like to, you know, we all like to, to have the conversations that we're doing everything perfect, but absolutely not perfect on every call. I totally can can talk too much and can over speak and forget to ask questions. So I think that's just a good reminder of like, if you're a sales leader and you're jumping in, whether you're a manager or VP and you're helping out, like make sure that you're not just steamrolling everything. Make sure that you're complimenting your rep, right? You're complimenting them. You're, com you're, you're a team and a united front. So that's what I'm taking away from it. And for me, it's, it's what you said, Stratton, which I, don't, I think I'm guilty of not doing enough, which is every opportunity you've been brought into, what is that coaching moment for the rep that brought you in? Right? What is the coaching moment that you can help them with so that next time they fly the nest on their own or, or, or realize I'm not going to bring you Nes because this is a technical sale. I'm going to bring the CTO instead. You sit this one out and giving them that empowerment. So how do you turn it into a coaching moment? I think that's a that's what I'm going to take away. 
Olivier, you know everything, so it's all good. No, I'm kidding. What's what's one thing uh, a reminder? That's what I love about this stuff. Is like we all kind of know this stuff, but like, what's the stuff we're just not doing? That's like in the back of our heads. That we're gonna start now. Any anything from your end, Olivier? I I would just say you know um, you need calls recording software when you buy your CRM, all right? And you need to record everything. And then it's not just to train sales reps. It's also that you know you can hold you know, your customers accountable in the sales cycle, you wrote this, you said this and here, and then you're churning for this reason. I'm like, I don't get it. Right. And so it helps uh, people to be accountable. And I think that's critical. The other thing is for product, right? I, I, I'm a salesperson, but you know, I, I love product and I've always been very involved at the software companies that I work at and, and giving guidance to, you know, the engineering and uh, the product team. And so that is critical. And if you are not sharing call recordings with your product team, um, and they're not doing it themselves where they're going in every week and listening to some calls, like you have to do that, especially from a competitive standpoint, right? If you are in a space that has two, three, four, five, com 10 competitors, you need to have those call recordings so that you can learn what prospects are saying about it. And then you can, you know, basically learn a lot of you know, information that you can review and share with your product team. So uh, I, you know, one thing here is, you know, this is a, a big promotion for Gong. I'm not sponsored by Gong but I think they have a really good tool. And Accord's decent as well. Um, all right, well, we're at the Accord's great. Uh, our entire go-to market, uh, you know, uh, leverages Accord. So I'm a huge fan of it. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, you guys, for taking out of your busy schedules and days and closing deals and coaching reps to, to share with the world. We're going to be turning this into a recording as well as a blog post. So the folks that are on the phones right now and emails that weren't able to join can check that out. Uh, but again, thanks so much for sharing your hard earned knowledge and uh, everyone else for, for tuning in. And hopefully you guys have a great in a quarter. I know a lot of yes. people got about 10 days to go. So uh, have some fun and kick some ass. Thanks Ross. Thanks, man. thanks everyone. Thanks Ross. Thank Bye. you everyone.